Today on How to Drink, it's a Royal Rumble as I face these five flavored rums off that I know nothing about against the rums of my choosing in randomly selected rum cocktails. If you're not sold on this episode, give it time, okay? Just give it a minute. It's gonna be good. This is going in a fun place, okay? Just come on. It'll be good. It'll be good. Come on. Don't leave. Come on. Stop it. Don't look at what else is playing. Just come on. <laughs> I got these five samples of rum in front of me. These are flavored rums that I know nothing about. And yes, we did the whiskey wheel and the vodka wheel. This is a new iteration on that. We have some new ideas we wanted to do. We got five flavored rums. I can't identify them. Meredith poured them. There's a lot of smells going on here. I don't know which is coming from what. If I stuck my nose in it, I'd probably identify it, but I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't even want to know what's in here. And we've got five classic rum-based cocktails that we're going to pull out of this here mystery tea kettle at random. And then I will make that cocktail with the rum of my choosing, the rum I think that would work for that cocktail. And then one of these, just at random. I'll just grab one and that'll be it. And we'll face them off against each other. That'll be fun. So let's get ready to rumble. All right, here's our first drink. And the winning drink is mojito. I love a mojito. So the first thing I gotta do is cut up some limes to get at their good, good lime juice. I'm just gonna split up three limes and each of these mojitos needs a ounce of lime juice. All right, so there we go, an ounce of lime juice in each. And I've done mojitos a couple different ways. Actually, we did a whole episode breaking down mojitos. Anders Ericsson had a really cool take on a mojito that I liked a lot. He called it the slow mojito. Half an ounce is simple into each of these. So we're gonna add a bunch of mint to this. A couple schools of thought here. Uh, you know, you can leave it on the stem. You can take it off the stem. I'm just gonna leave it on the stem today. We're gonna go fast and loose. I like a lot of mint in my mojito. Um, kind of an insane amount. All right, now I gotta pick my rum. I mean, I think the traditional in Cuba is a three-year Havana Club, which is a very neutral rum. I think that the, my Hamilton white stash would be a very nice choice there. Don Q would be good there. The Plantation Three Star. Yeah, let's go with that. So the left, this will be mine. All right, and there you go. Two ounces of our Plantation Three Star. And then for this one, I gotta pick one of these guys. I'll just pick this first white one that's in front of me. No idea what this is. All right, and then I'm gonna leave that down here, mark it as used. What? No, the color, this one is the yellow one. Grab my muddler, and I'm gonna muddle. And uh, when I muddle, I really just push straight down. I don't really do any twisting. I just wanna crush this without tearing it, without shredding it. We're just kinda really bruising it. And then I do this stupid move, to try and get all the stuff that's on my muddler off of it. So we've got our rum in there. We've got our drinks all built. I've muddled them. Let's get some ice in there and stir them up. Got my nice ice in here. There we go. I'm gonna give these guys a stir. All right, almost there. Come on, baby. Make some seltzer with my handy dandy drink meat. Just pick up one of these. They are great. They'll carbonate anything. Technically, I could have carbonated this cocktail. Put it up there in the little linky eyeball thing, the A little letter I, and I'll put it down there and you can pick one up and uh, it's an affiliate link and that's great for me and you and everybody. Love this thing. It's really good. It's way better than soda stream. And there we have our seltzer. A straw for each. There we go. All right, there's my mojitos. I might garnish these or something like that or whatever, but like frankly, for this episode, it doesn't matter. Here is my Plantation Three Star Mojito. It's a delicious mojito. I'm gonna finish that drink today. Exactly what a mojito should be. Minty, bubbly, lime, tart, balanced with sweetness. Very refreshing drink. I love it. And here we have my mystery rum. I don't know what this is. It's the moment of truth. I guess the first thing I gotta do is identify the rum and then find out if it made a good mojito. So whatever this rum was, let's see. No, oh, it did I gotta wash that down, hold on. Oh man, it's so sweet. Whoo, that's bad. Oh, there's like a, mm. oh, that tastes like cough syrup. That tastes, this tastes like some kind of cough syrup for real. I cannot identify what the rum is supposed to be flavored like. Mary, what is that? That is the Dr Bacardi Dragonberry. Dragonberry? What the hell's a dragonberry? I think it's supposed to be like, it has pictures of dragon fruits and strawberries, so. Okay. It's a mixed berry Oops. Yeah. situation. Yeah, I was never gonna guess that, but okay, berry. Yeah, okay, so it's a wild berry. This is a Dr Bacardi wild berry. Dragon fruit doesn't really have a lot of flavor to it, so. Oh yeah, that makes perfect sense because it tastes like cough syrup. This makes for a very poor mojito. Uh, let's try to describe it. Very sweet, that berry fruit, berry syrup flavor beats the mint. This drink does not lack for evolution, I'm gonna tell you that. It takes a second turn at the end that is like chewed up bits of plastic that were been slightly burned and melted, puked into your mouth by someone else. No, it's not good. 
But I mean, like, this will never be good. What would you do with this? The only thing you can do with this is make a, a, a seltzer. You just throw this in seltzer. They suggest putting it with ginger ale. No, no more sugar. Take this, put an ounce of it into seltzer and make like basically a hard seltzer. That'd be fine, I guess, if you like that flavor. There's nothing else you can do with it. That's disgusting. Today on Drink This, Not That, uh, if you're gonna make a mojito, uh, use Plantation Three Star. Don't use this. It's better use any actual rum. Uh, that would be fine. It's a very good mojito. Fuck. We'll be picking up some more on Curiata, drink.curiata.com. We'll be right back with the next uh, pull from the kettle and the selection of my mystery rums. Very nightmare down the drain. Goodbye. Hey, Meredith. Greg? You ever worry about your hair thinning? No. Good for you. I'd probably go with Keeps to prevent hair loss, which is convenient because they happen to be the sponsor of this episode. Look, two out of three guys are going to experience hair loss by the time they're 35. And uh, if that were you, and maybe you'd want to do something about it, Keeps connects you with a licensed medical professional to figure out the right treatment. No, not that. Right treatment for your specific situation. And they ship it to you uh, every three months. Well, that might be it. That might be the good. Yeah, we might go with how do you wear that? You like that? And then you do this thing. You know, the truth of the matter is here, Meredith, there's only there's only a, a couple of drugs that are, are FDA approved to treat hair loss and, and Keeps is entirely built around uh, prescribing and supplying you with the generic versions of these, uh, which makes it affordable and simple. You can do it all. You can do it all from home. You know, if you happen to be ready to take action and prevent hair loss, you could go to Keeps. Uh, dot com slash how to drink or use the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's uh, that would be K E E P S dot com slash how to drink. So uh, I think I'm just going to go with this though. What do you think? I think you look great. Great. Uh, so back to the show then. We're back and the drink of the day is a daiquiri. So let's make a couple of daiquiris. Daiquiri is, of course, classic Cuban cocktail. There's some question about the origin of its invention. Some some engineer dude from America claims to have invented it. I don't think that's true. He may have popularized it in the States. A combination of lime, simple syrup, and rum. Shaken. Very simple drink. There are, of course, frozen daiquiris. It's a whole other thing. So now we need our short tin. Ounce of lime juice in each one of these guys. These, these guys, these guys. If you're using a one-to-one -one simple stop first off, but if you are, then I would recommend that you go equal parts lime to simple. If you're using a two-to-one simple, which is two parts sugar to one part water, good, do that. And then I would say use three quarters of an ounce to your ounce of lime. So there we go, three quarters. And it's not that you're gonna dislike it if you go all the way up to equal parts, but I do think that like you lose a little of the edge that you want with a daiquiri, or maybe you don't know you want. Maybe you haven't had a daiquiri with a little edge on it, but you want a little edge on a daiquiri, trust me. It shouldn't be a heavy drink. It should be a light drink. It should float right out of the glass and into your mouth. And then the other thing I was gonna address too is like sometimes when we do these episodes with random bottles, people say, oh, but you should, you should try to make a good cocktail with that. You shouldn't just throw it in using like the existing spec of something else, you should really workshop that and make it into a good drink and stuff like that. I cannot, which is kind of the point of these episodes. They are basically objectively bad and there's not much I can do to elevate them. Additionally, that we're playing with is the fact that a daiquiri calls for two ounces of rum. Maybe it'll specify light rum. It doesn't go further than that. Now, if these are rums, should they not yield daiquiris? That's the whole thing, right? If these rums be rums, should they not yield daiquiris when shaken? In my Shakespearean soliloquy. So let's say I'm gonna make a daiquiri. I think the two ways to go here, and I do like a daiquiri with some funk in it. Oh, maybe I'll use my Bob and Cordae. All right, yeah, if we're gonna, this is for me, this is a daiquiri. Is this traditional? No. This is a pot-stilled Haitian rum with eight years of age on it. It's like all of the wrong things for a daiquiri. Daiquiri is supposed to be like a three-year Cuban Havana club. That's like the standard. Don Q Crystal, excellent choice. Hamilton 87, excellent choice. Loving this rum lately, but I only have one bottle, so I'm kind of starting to jealously guard it. <laughs> and they're kind of hard to find too. But not at drink.curiata.com. But uh, yeah, I think that this is a little funky. This is sort of like almost a hybrid between a Cuban and a Jamaican style of rum. And it brings some real Mm, snappy character to a daiquiri. So I'm gonna go with that for my build. And then I guess I gotta take another light rum for my other daiquiri. So we'll find out what this is in a moment. Let's start with my barber court. That's a little dark. It's got some color on it, a little oak on it. Two ounces, always two ounces. Two ounces of rum in your daiquiri. And now I'm gonna put in two ounces of mysterious light rum. 
Mm -hmm. Let's get some ice into these shakers. Crack them in there. My right arm's better at this than my left. I'm not so coordinated over here. Okay, this is the rum barbon court. Not a traditional look for a daiquiri, that yellowish color. I like it, it doesn't bother me. Because I know there's good rum in there. And now this is the mystery rum. This one needs to be double strained because it must have abused the ice a little bit much. Uh, rum Barbancourt 8 daiquiri, here we go. Oh, uh, garnishing the lime wheel or don't. Yeah, I've been making my daiquiris lately, which is a go-to around the old house with the Don Q and lighter rums, but I haven't. I used to make them with this all the time and I might go back because there is such a dance of flavors when you use this kind of a rum here. You still get that balance of sharp lime and sweetness that you know it's a daiquiri. That's what it is. You know, this is a quality daiquiri, but then the rum takes it into a third direction in this estery, lightly funky place. And then it does a couple little twists and turns on that. What is that? That's a funky flavor. I don't know. It's hard to describe it beyond calling it the rum funk which comes from using a pot still to make rum mostly and the way it's aged. It is a pungent kind of sharp chemical thing. It's not unlike what you would imagine rotting bananas in a hot sun, but like all the way at the other end of a dock, that smell. It's not unlike that, but it also, I would not say it smells or tastes like bananas, but it's like that, that, you know, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I like a funkier rum in my daiquiri as well. Yeah. I'll do like, if we have Smith and Cross, sometimes I'll do that. I, because it's limes and sugar, I just like, the weirder, the better. The lime and sugar gives you license to take it in other directions. Of course, a neutral daiquiri is very good as well. Now, I, I was wondering if my explanation of what rum funk tastes like, if you would agree. Sure. Okay, she agrees. Now we have our mystery rum. Let's see. Whoa. Honestly, better than the berry mojito. Ugh. It just punished me for saying that. It is banana, right? Yeah. Okay. You can smell this one right away. Oh, you can immediately. Cruising banana rum. My question would be like, what makes one bad, good banana and what makes one bad banana? It's a deep philosophical question. Whom is the second banana? Weirdly, this almost works. I gotta say, it's too sweet. But there is something right on the front of that profile. The way that the banana and the lime are interacting is almost interesting. And then it leaves you with this like kind of lingering tart kind of tangy thing with like not a super overpowering amount of banana. I would never think that a banana daiquiri would be good. And it's not. But I have been convinced now that a banana daiquiri might be good. I wonder if you use this at a ratio that was like half this to a normal rum would work. And look, we can even try that. Watch what we're gonna do. We're gonna take our, the only reason I'm using this on the glass is to help it pour, because it's gonna give it a little bit of directionality when I try to pour this. Okay, that's one ounce of cocktail A, uh, one ounce or thereabouts of cocktail B. And so now we've got the daiquiri that is uh, part of each. And this is just the glass that Meredith got me. That shows some promise. I don't know, I'm back and forth. I can't decide. I think if there's a version of that that could work, but I don't think this is the rum to pair with this rum. And maybe this is not good banana rum. Is there good banana rum? I don't know. All right, so let's move it right along. We're gonna pull the next drink from the old tea kettle right after this. All right, we're back and I'm pulling another lucky winner right from the tea kettle of doom. We're making it El Presidente. I love the El Presidente. It's a wonderful drink. I almost never make them. They are not one that I just happen to reach for a lot. It's a stirred drink, so we're going to need two mixing glasses. And there we are, mixing glass heaven. This drink calls for a bar spoon of grenadine. There's two schools of thought, right? I think one says put it into the glass before you pour it. No, I'm putting it into my drink before we stir it. I got my grenadine right here, homemade grenadine. You can make your own, it's very easy. I'll put a link in the pin comp below and up here in the corner on how to make grenadine. And I'm gonna add a bar spoon. Maybe I'll go a little more. Maybe I'll do two bar spoons. I've heard people say that, oh, the grenadine is just there for the color in this drink. I can't verify that to be a fact, but it's there. So next ingredient, some curacao, quarter ounce, just a little bit, a little bit of curacao. It's a very delicate drink. It's a stirred drink. It's not a, a sour or whatever. So keeping things correctly in balance and in proportion is actually really important to making this drink just right. The next thing you want is an ounce and a half of a blanc vermouth, okay? Now blanc, is not the same thing as dry. If you use a dry vermouth in this drink, you're going to think, well, that's not a very good drink. But if you use a blanc vermouth, you're going to like it. And that is a thing that will trip you up. I'm using the Dolan Vert Blanc. I've heard it's been pronounced Dolan. 
It's a Delan. I'm using a Delan Blanc Vermouth. Uh, one and a half ounces, right? So it's actually equal parts to the rum that we're gonna get to in a moment. Now, I got my rums over here. What am I gonna use for a rum in my A drink, in the drink where I'm picking the rum? I'll tell you what, a lot of people will tell you that this drink is a Cuban drink and it calls for Cuban rum. I don't have any Cuban rum on hand. I'm gonna go with the Plantation Five Year. I was almost gonna go for the Appleton Estates Reserve, but I don't think so. I think this is also a kind of drink where if you have a, a nice rum, something with a little age on it, something with a little mellowing, something with a little oak time, this is a drink that's gonna benefit. In some ways, this is sort of the rum answer to a Martinez. So I'm using Plantation Five Year, excellent rum, love this stuff. Okay, I got three glasses here of dark rums, you know, not white rums. And this one at the right, just based on the color, I like the color, I think the color is right for this drink. That's all I know about it. One and a half ounces. Crack some ice in these, stir them up. I only have one bar spoon, so I can't do that neat trick where you stir two things at once, but that's okay. Stirring right now, this is the Plantation Five Year. I do love the smell of this drink. Mm. And then this is the mystery rum. And so we've got our our, our, this is now our, our communitarian plantation five year. And this is our mystery rum. Each of these guys want an orange twist. And personally, I actually do favor just kind of sitting it on top of the glass or even just dropping it in there. I think that's fine. It's crazy. You can really hear it hitting the, the drink in this. For experimental purposes, right? We don't need to make these fully presentational. We're just kind of playing here. We're just new boot goofing. Just goofing. Just new boot goofing. At Reno 911 fans. All right, here we go. This is the El Presidente made with Plantation Five Year. My choice of rum. Oh, what a cozy, warm rum just comes up behind you and wraps you in a wonderfully thick and fluffy wool sweater by the fire. It's got this orange, the little drop of curacao, like that quarter ounce of curacao is so present in this drink with the twist of orange peel on the top. They kind of conspire together. The sweetness, is so balanced. Honestly, I'm a rum person. This is my martini. There is a huge amount of this kind of like a raisiny. Americans are gonna have a very negative association with this fruit cake. But if you are thinking of like a figgy pudding, like the English equivalent of a fruit cake, that's what I get. I get currants. I get like raisins. I get brown sugar. So many wonderful flavors out of this. Mm. Oh my God, that is one of the great cocktails. I love the El Presidente because it's one where a lot of people make it with dry vermouth because they read, especially even if you go to an old book, you're gonna see blanc vermouth, you're gonna see white vermouth. And you think that there's two kinds of vermouth. There's sweet, which is red, and dry, which is white. But that's not true. There's a third type, blanc, which is white, which is neither dry nor red. And you must use a Blanc Vermouth in this. You will have a terrible time with this. Lille Blanc is actually also a perfectly acceptable way to go. I think he'll just as good. In fact, that's kind of my default. And I think I'm not speaking out of turn when I say that Lille Blanc is basically a Blanc Vermouth. But if you use a dry Vermouth, it's gonna be like a dry, overly dry, thin, no body kind of, not much of a drink. Okay, now that we've had one of the most splendid and exquisite experiences in all of cocktaildom that I've ever had, let's have the mystery rum. That's not bad at all. Not too, too sweet though. It's not that far off from where we are in the other drink. It's very different. I don't know what rum that is, but I kind of like that. Is that a coconut rum? It kind of feels like there's a toasted coconut nut note in there. Oh, there I get it a little bit more, yeah. It kind of lingers and balances and dances. I'm actually, that is a coconut rum, right? Can I see what it is? Coconut cartel special. I've never had this before. Guatemalan dark rum with coconut water. Oh, that's funny with coconut water because I can taste the coconut water. What's the proof on this though? It's 40% alcohol. So that's 80 proof compared to the plantation, which I think is like the same, right? Yeah, they're exactly the same proof. It's just funny because like when they read Guatemalan dark rum with coconut water, maybe they're de-proofing it with coconut water. Like it comes out of the still at like, you know, 120, 160 proof or whatever it is. And then you're de-proofing with coconut water. That would make sense. By the way, you know that, right? Like when you are a alcohol dealer, you get your product and then you step on it with water down till like it's cut deep enough that like your clientele will still pay you money for it and won't get pissy. Yeah, it's drugs. We're dealing drugs. You know, like this rum has been too stepped on. It's like 30% alcohol, but this is not like this is actually it's a nice bottle too. I kind of like the base on this thing. It's really cool. I'm surprised. This is a real twist because this is actually genuinely good. Do I like it better than my plantation five year? 
not really, but that's just because like, I'm not really looking for an El Presidente to be a coconut cocktail. If you were, this is surprisingly good. This is as far away from Malibu as you can possibly get. It really is. It's not like a tanning oil at all. It tastes like coconut water and it's very enjoyable. I think that um, your first thought is put it in a coconut cocktail, but what's maybe more interesting with something like this is to put coconut flavors into a drink that does not have coconut in it. It makes a very good El Presidente. It's a very interesting twist on an El Presidente. That said, I kind of like my El Presidente better if I have to pick between them if I'm comparing, but like it, one shouldn't be better than the other. That's just down to personal preference. This is a perfectly serviceable coconut El Presidente. I think that this would be really interesting in a Mai Tai just because like it doesn't have any coconut in there, but like it wouldn't mind having some coconut in there. Neat, very cool, man. The, this episode is putting me three sheets to the wind. Well, I'm gonna be right back with another. We got two more of these to go. I don't know how I'm gonna make it through. I will make it through, I'm a professional. Uh, another pull at my beautiful kettle of mystery, my mysterious kettle. All right, so this is the next drink from my kettle. What have we got here? It's a weird one, the Queen's Park Swizzle, nice. Queen's Park Swizzle is a phenomenal rum drink, one of my favorites of all time. It needs crushed ice and, you know, in a perfect world, you have a thing here called a swizzle stick or a lele stick. These are made in a couple of Caribbean countries, and I forget, actually, they're made from a tree or a shrub. There's some countries they grow them, they have the five that come out, so you get a five, and then a couple of islands they grow them, they have four. And it depends on which variant of the tree you have. And I do remember that. If you scrape this, they tend to smell like Angostura bitters. Yeah, they have a lot of spicy smells in them. Anyway, but they're cheap. They're like a buck 99 on the internet. <laughs> so we're going to make a Queen's Park Swizzle. I'm gonna build them in the glass and I'm gonna use these guys. These are like short hurricanes. I think they're called Poco glasses or Poco something. Normally you put something like this into a highball glass, but um, I was already doing other drinks in a highball, so I wanted to differentiate them visually. We're gonna start with some lime juice. So half an ounce of lime juice built in the glass. Half an ounce of simple syrup going in here. This is the rum I would use in this drink, given what I've got on hand. This is 69% alcohol, plantation, OFTD, old fashioned, traditional dark. I know that none of these flavored rums are gonna be 69% alcohol. But then I remembered like, I don't need to keep these things equal. I need to use the rum I wanted to use. And this is what I wanna use. Two ounces of 69% OFTD goes into my version and boom, just like that. So I'm just gonna take the darker of the two. That's the deal here. <laughs> Whatever's darker. And we're gonna pour in my dark mystery rum. Uh, we need to add some mint, which I should have done already. Probably each one of these will get a sprig's worth of leaves. And I'm actually looking for the ones that are more wilty because they're the ones that are perfect for this job. We wanna keep our nice looking ones for garnishes. Again, like a mojito, I like a fair amount of mint in these. Okay, that's good. So a lot of recipes you're gonna see call for like two dashes of Angostura bitters. That's bullshit. You put eight to 10 dashes of Angostura bitters in a Queen's Park Swizzle. So let's get them in there, you ready? That's 10. Okay, so now I'm gonna throw some ice in these. Crushed ice for a swizzle. And I crushed this before we started shooting because I made this drinks list. I'm gonna go about that far up right now. Get my swizzle out, work it down in there. You might be asking, why didn't you muddle that mint? You don't need to, because you're swizzling. More ice. Top these suckers up. Garnish these with a sprig of mint, a fresh looking one. Sometimes I like to throw a couple extra dashes of Ango on there, but it's not really necessary at this point. There we have a couple of Queens Park swizzles. Uh, let's see how my version with the OFTD went. Oh man, <laughs> that could use a touch more sweetness, but whoa, what a big flavor. What a caricable drink. So much minty and crisp. The crushed ice really changes it too, by the way. Just freshness paired up with like this intensely earthy, allspice, nutmeg, mace, clove kind of, mm kick from the Angostura, and then this very big, loud, high proof bottom end from the OFTD. Oh my God, younger Greg would love that drink. Older Greg knows that if I finish that, I will immediately fall asleep. Damn, that's a good drink. Uh, quick note on the Queen Sparks Whistle. I, I forget the year it was invented, but it's not a tiki drink, right? It predates tiki. This is a drink that comes from the Queen's Park Hotel in Trinidad. And I think, I wanna say it was invented in 1919, which causes it to predate the kind of birth of Tiki, which is like maybe the early 30s, maybe the late 20s. Kind of an ersatz celebration of Polynesia and certainly not the Caribbean, although 
Sometimes the Caribbean gets in there anyway, but they're focusing on imitating Polynesia with tiki drinks. Is it a drink that belongs on the menu at a tiki restaurant though? The answer is yes, without a doubt. I mean, this is a truly great drink and it fits into that flavor profile. It's just not a uh, tiki drink, technically, if you're, if you're playing by the Marcus of Queensberry rules. This is my mystery rum version of a Queen Sparks Whistle. Meredith knows what it is and she just gave the stinkiest face the Queen's Park Swizzle takes no prisoners. I it, I don't know what, I just taste mint and Angostura bitters. I don't know what that rum was. It just tastes like a slightly sweeter Queen's Park Swizzle. What the fuck is that? Is there no aftertaste? Nothing. Coffee. Okay, the instant you said that, I started detecting it. Well, let me see it. Dude, I think we've caught, I think we've hit something here. This is actually cool. <gasps> Mr. Black Queen's Park Swizzle. Oh my God, but this is actually great too. Shipwreck, I think they make that sort of, I think they bottle that near me. Shipwreck is, I think, a pretty respectable brand of flavored rums. This is a drink for somebody who wants 69% rum. This drink is loud and rummy. This one is screaming, burning house fire rum in your face. This does not do that. This is a very sweet drink, very accessible drink, very accessible version. I am shocked. What a wonderful discovery, by the way. And that's what's fun about something like this, right? I'm putting things together I would never think to put together because I'm doing it in the dark. I don't know what I'm doing. So I get to find these cool surprises like this and the coconut rum. What a surprising thing that a coffee Queen's Park Swizzle is a good idea. Maybe not perfected here, but God damn, it's close. Yeah, and you do taste the coffee. Now that I've thought about it, it had this very interesting kind of brightness, tang that was missing here. I think that's the acidity of the coffee interacting with the lime and the mint and the Angostura. And then you do get just the most intensely enjoyable spicy notes, baking spices from that interplay as it evolves. Shockingly good. It's not minty. In fairness, my Queen Spark Swizzle falls a little short of being a minty drink too, and they really should be kind of minty. Not quite like a mojito. Those are both good. These are both winners. That's really tough to pick actually. Well, will wonders never cease? Today on How to Drink, we discover a surprise. Indeed, we are delighted to learn that a coffee rum can make an excellent Queen's Park Swizzle. A coffee park swizzle, if you are. A Queen's Park Cafe, perhaps. All right, moving right along, we're gonna get to our last drink, which I already know because I am the person who picked these drinks, although not the rums. Whatever's in that last glass of rum is going into Mai Tai right after this. All right, let's go ahead and make a Mai Tai. Two of them, actually. I'm gonna start by cutting up some limes. I think a Mai Tai is one of the great drinks of all time. I also think it's one of the drinks that is, maybe it's getting a better reputation now, but it used to have a really bad reputation of just being like a Mai Tai. Oh my God. Certainly you can get bad Mai Tais out there. Um, I'm not a fan of the, uh, it's like a, I think it's the Royal Hawaiian, they call it. It's the Mai Tai that they serve at this hotel in Hawaii that kind of got famous for being the Mai Tai, but like the Mai Tai, the Trader Vic's, Vic Bergeron, that's Trader Vic, by the way, is uh, I think honestly one of the great pieces <laughs> of 20th century American art. I think it belongs at the Museum of Modern Art. I don't know how you put a Mai Tai in the Museum of Modern Art, but I think it should be in there. You should be able to walk into the Museum of Modern Art and go up to a gallery where a rotating sort of bartender is just there and says, Mai Tai? And hands you a Mai Tai as they make it. I think that should be part of the experience there. You should be able to order a couple of co cocktails actually. This would be an American cocktail thing at the Museum of Modern Art because they are truly are a modern art and the making and inventing of these drinks is something that I think really shaped and is shaped by the 20th century. Let's put an ounce of lime juice into this cocktail. Something a little bitter, a little tart, I don't know. We want three quarters of an ounce of orzo. Some people tell me that I'm saying it wrong, orzo. Some people say it's pronounced orza. Some people say it's pronounced orgit. I don't know what's right, but what I do know is that small hand foods if you're looking for a commercially available one, makes it excellent or jot. And it's the one that I based my own personal recipe on. And frankly, I use it all the time on the show because I'm too lazy uh, to make my own. So, but mine's pretty good too. And uh, I'll put a link to that up there, but also a link to this. You can make your choice about what you want to do. I'm going to need three quarters of an ounce of this. Now I've changed this recipe over the years. I have modified it to suit my needs. It used to be much more complicated. Two different rums, lime juice. I would split the or jot with simple syrup. I've come to realize that like you don't need simples here. You just need orgeat, three quarters of an ounce in each. There we go. One, this is in its essence, still the original 1943 Trader Vic's recipe, but I've just pared it down to make it a little bit less 
you don't need simple and origin. You should just use the origin. What you want in this drink is a powerful almond flavor. Why moderate that? Why not just let that run wild, okay? Now we add a half an ounce of dry curacao, and maybe that's true. Maybe like my recipes evolved because I just decided to start using dry curacao and Trader Vic was using a different orange liqueur. I don't know. Half an ounce of dry curacao. Uh, if you don't have dry curacao, Grand Marnier would be the closest equivalent. Not Cointreau. Cointreau is bone dry, super duper tart. Now, normally I do a split rum base. I do two different rums here from two different rum production regions. People at home, should I use one rum here? Because I'm only going to be able to use this singular flavored rum for this one, it's gonna be the weirdo, or should I do as I would and use two rums? Meredith, what do you think? I'm gonna say do as you would and I have a reason for it and I'll explain it later. Okay, so we're gonna do as we would. In that case, I'm gonna use Plantation 5. I'm going to use a Rum JM, white. Oh yeah, a little Martinique action. And a Lemon Heart and Sons. Get some of that funky funk. Okay, so here's what I do. I'm gonna make one ounce of Plantation 5, half an ounce of Rum JM White. This is an Agricola, which means it's made from fresh pressed cane, and it is a little bit more funky dunky. It's got some esters to it. It's a little different, a little fresher. It's got some toir. And this is a Lemon Heart and Sons 151. We're gonna do a half an ounce of this. And that brings us to two ounces total of rum for Greg's preferred Mai Tai. And when I say preferred, these are the three rums I saw back here that I said, those will be fun together. I change that up all the time, but the deal is for me in a Mai Tai, two ounces of rum, mix it up. Now, our wackadoo mystery Mai Tai is gonna get two ounces of whatever's in this glass. We're flying by the seats of our pants. We got our shakers. Shake these over entirely cracked ice. I used to build these over crushed ice or shake them and then pour them over crushed ice. I think well cracked ice is fine here. All right, here we go. Cracking two cubes of big ice into each of these and I'm cracking it as much as I can possibly break it up. All right, here we go. My Mai Tai on the left, the Lord's Mai Tai on the right. <laughs> Whatever, oh, that smells strong of cigars. Doesn't need a lot of shaking because it's got so much cracked, cracked, cracked ice in it. All right, we got two different Mai Tais here. I have one Mai Tai glass and one zombie glass. My other Mai Tai glass broke, but both of these came from Trader Sam's at Disney World, so they, we're good. So we're gonna just dump these, which means we're not gonna strain them at all. And that's Mai Tai the first, my Mai Tai. And this is uh, your Mai Tai. This is your tie going to that zombie head. Now, I, for whatever reason, don't have short, straight straws. Part of this drink for me is that you wanna force the drinker's face really close to it. So I'm actually gonna use these upside down so that these behave like short straws. Then, as per tradition, you must take the squeezed hull of a lime that you made the drink with and put it in there like in a little island. And then we make a palm tree with a sprig of mint, basically. But I personally say, if that sprig of mint, it's gotta be right near that straw. That's why I want that short straw, to put your nose right up into the mint. Yeah, I know a Mai Tai is not a drink that's like a minty drink, but if you have a Mai Tai with and without the mint garnish, I think that you're gonna always want it with the mint garnish. It makes it a, it's a much better drink that way. Here we go, this is Greg's Mai Tai. Bright, balanced, undersweet, honestly. I think that against those rums I picked today, I'd put a little bit of extra sugar in there. Tart, but overall very enjoyable. It's a little sharper, a little bit more. The notes in the rum are a little brighter than I thought they were gonna skew. Hence why it's a little under sweet. Another quarter ounce, half an ounce of simple syrup in there and we're, we're golden. Let's try your tie, the Lord's Mai Tai, if you will, from this shrunken head. It tastes like bubble gum, what the heck is that? <laughs> Orange vanilla twist. Yeah, okay. It's a creamsicle, huh? That's right, that's why I was like, you can have two, because they have two flavors. Yeah, so this is an, a creamsicle Mai Tai. It's not undrinkable. Honestly, everything else is going on in there really balances what I assume is a pretty sweet, okay, it's 30%, so it's underproofed. If you were gonna make a, a creamsicle Mai Tai, maybe balance this with some overproof like I did to kind of get us to where we wanna be for uh, final ABV range. But the concept isn't the worst. Flavor-wise, vanilla and orange with the lime, with the almond, and you know, the mint and the, and of course there's already orange in there from the curacao and you cut that. But like flavor wise, they're not really in conflict. That kind of works. I think that you'd have to really work on the ratios here to get it just right. A creamsicle Mai Tai is not the, apparently the craziest idea I've ever heard. 
It's probably less sweet, actually, than people expect a Mai Tai to be, if they've never had a Mai Tai. Maybe sweeter than a Mai Tai aficionado would expect a Mai Tai to be, such as myself. But um, not unbearably sweet at all. This is the Mai Tai for people like me who love rum. I acknowledge that this Mai Tai is less accessible and it needs sugar to become more accessible, but I love this Mai Tai. A conclusion it sounds like that is come out of this is if you're going to buy flavored alcohols, whiskeys, vodkas, whatever, go with rum flavored rums. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I hadn't thought about that, but you're right because like flavored rums are much closer in utility to their unflavored, quote, real rum counterparts than like a flavored whiskey or a flavored vodka. You could take a flavored rum and put it into a rum-based cocktail. It might not work right away, but I bet you can figure out a way to make it work. This went much better than I thought it was going to. I'm shocked, actually. I mean, very sweet, most of these. Some of the flavors are really weird, but I don't think that the idea of a, I don't know, a creamsicle Mai Tai, could you make a creamsicle Mai Tai without betraying everything that a Mai Tai is about? Believe it or not, I think the answer is yes. I really do. Because it's not like almond is a flavor that doesn't go with orange and vanilla. It, it works well. It's just about getting the balance right. Could you make a banana daiquiri? You could, actually. I actually think that, that could work. I don't think we nailed it here. Could you make a coffee Queen's Park Swizzle? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. That, it's got serious potential on that one. Yeah, the berry mojito. Ugh. Not so good. I actually don't think that's good stuff. Bacardi Dragonberry. No, you will never use this for anything. This is really truly disgusting. This smells like an old strawberry shortcake doll from the 80s. Uh, don't drink this at all. Just pour this away, get rid of it. But all these other ones were actually pretty serviceable. They just require rethinking some drinks to make them work. Yeah, pleasantly surprised. Uh, I'm still gonna reach for my Mai Tai though. If you guys like this show and you wanna see it keep going, why don't you like, subscribe, and comment? All that stuff. Meredith, did you know that we're on social media? I, I follow you everywhere. Yeah, How to Drink is, I'm on social media, Twitter, Twitch, TikTok, Instagram, and Patreon. Patreon is a great way to support the show if you're interested in that kind of thing. You'll find the parts of the episodes that weren't really meant to go to YouTube in there sometimes. And if you like the show, I've been making it forever, probably since you were born, and you will find four more episodes right here, right now, that you may have not ever seen before. So please give them a click. Like, comment, subscribe, why not? You don't have to though, it doesn't matter. Anybody who tells you different, they're lying. All right, see you guys next time on another HTD. Good night, good luck, see you soon, bye.